Chris, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. So um, I'm a Canadian. I live in Toronto. Um, I make a living as an engineer. I have a small uh, design and analysis firm, and we help people develop products, machines, all kinds of stuff. Um, I guess as part of perhaps a midlife crisis, I went to seminary. <laughs> it's, it's probably more expensive than the red sports car. Oh, I, I got one too. No. Uh, <laughs> just, just to cover the bases, you know? <laughs> but it was more expensive, you're right. <laughs> um. So uh, I went to seminary at a, a, a small seminary here in Toronto called Tyndale. I took an MTS, a Master's of Theological Studies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm married. I, we now have an empty nest. Um, we were uh, foster parents, as well as I had a couple kids, a uh, couple stepchildren from my wife. Mm -hmm. um, so we were foster parents for many, many years. So that's really formative for me in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? I grew up a Christian. Uh, probably my earliest memories of, uh, I don't remember not being a Christian. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, sort of grew up in, I guess in the seventies, my parents were really involved in the charismatic movement. Oh, okay. We shipped all over Ontario going to like the Mennonite charismatic conference Oh, fascinating. <laughs> All kinds of, oh, yeah. So um, pretty varied church background. Mm -hmm. um, when, I was, uh, when I was 12, I think, uh, our family became Catholic. So we were wow. baptized. Charismatic Mennonites to Roman Catholic. Oh, we weren't Mennonites. We just went to the Charismatic Conference. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> So you've 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 had a you've had a very diverse you've had a very diverse feasting on Christianity. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so, and, and most of it great. You know, obviously not every church experience has been spectacular. Right. Um, and so uh, I don't know uh, what am I missing out of components of what makes a person. I no, that's, that's cool. Kind of what cool. I do. Keep talking. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, I guess the engineering part of my life will become important in the conversation eventually. Um, so it's the work I do is fairly heavy uh, in analysis um, and looking at how things actually function in the world. Um, and that, I guess, coupled with taking some courses in seminary um, and having an interest in philosophy from when I went through my original bachelor's degree many years ago. Mm -hmm. and doing some reading um just had kind of combined in my head at some point a couple of years ago um oh yeah and i mean i grew up when you talk about reading lord of the rings for the first time yeah. i think i was in grade eight and started reading it and finished it in a weekend <laughs> <laughs> and, oh man i loved it i i read it uh religiously uh once a year uh, from then until when the movies came out hmm. and not that I didn't enjoy the movies, but yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, know. Had a, I had to break from reading because it's the movie images are all in my head. And I'm going, where are the images I grew up with? You know? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I also grew up reading CS Lewis, uh, right through. Um, I think I remember someone, uh, in a conversation I caught part of you having, Someone mentioned the space trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Luke, Luke really loves the space trilogy. Oh, as do I. I think. Have you touched it yet? Probably. I read the space trilogy when I was in high school. That was yeah. too young. I, I need to read it again. And I think I'm gonna on this. I got a lot of plane hours ahead of me. Maybe I'll load it up. Um, yeah, I think you can get it on Kindle pretty easily. Yeah, uh, yeah, Kindle uh, and yeah. Audible. So I'll right, it right. Audible. I think that the second book, Paralandra, is just gorgeous. It is just beautiful, uh, both in terms of just a picture of uh, a new Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. 
and what Lewis does with that in terms of temptation and ah, it's just it's just beautiful. Well, I'm gonna have to load it all up. Still yeah. trying to figure out what I I have to do some prep for my talks in in Melbourne yet. I'm still trying to say that name right, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But on the way back, um, you know, actually, where my son and I, my my one of my sons is going to be with me in in Melbourne. He's also an engineer. He wanted to be oh, yeah. a mechanical engineer, but then moved to Sacramento and got a job doing civil engineering. So right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's probably better off. I think they, they generally get paid better. Oh, I'll tell them. <laughs> I, it depends what industry, probably. Yeah. So actually, I forgot that one other uh, rather important element of my life is uh, for, I guess, it's going on 13 years now, my wife and I have been involved in uh, missions in Cuba. Oh. Um, and so that's, so my going back to seminary was a little bit tongue in cheek as a, midlife crisis uh not entirely but you know yeah um so we've been involved with a group down there and go down three or four times a year support them uh influence what they're doing guide you know and and we just fell in love with the people mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. the couple that run the uh the ministry we're involved with mm -hmm. but so many people and uh and it's been really really meaningful in fact mm -hmm. I think when I was going through a really dry period before we met them in my Christian walk, mm -hmm. um, you know, warn your son that engineering may grind. <laughs> it's it's going to be interesting because he, he does like, you know, he does like, he can just like other things like you do, like literature. He's right now he's, he's starting his starting job. He has a fair amount of free headspace. So he's, he's doing Dostoevsky right now. And, uh, Oh, wow. And, yeah. Uh, Solzhenitsyn and so he's he's been he's been with me with the meetups in Sacramento and um I think folks I and when my wife my wife couldn't get the time off for school so she's just we're going for a little bit ahead of time we're, we're doing some touring in Australia because why fly around the world and not see stuff and then yeah, she's yeah. flying back with the rest of the kids so then my son is staying but he's been into the Peterson stuff so he'll be um he'll really enjoy the, our time in Melbourne wonderful so I was really captivated by uh not at first, but by Peterson, not at yeah. first, but eventually I caught this, like, uh, I don't know, this whiff of sort of reconnecting worlds as, yes. as you were describing it. Yes. And like, and I had no idea that that's what it was uh, at the beginning. And maybe I didn't have any idea until you laid it out so nicely, mm. um, which I really appreciate. That's captain. That's what I basically started listening to you. I think uh, more carefully. Uh, than when it just happened to pop up on, on YouTube. And uh, I love that. And partly because I, I think growing up Christian, you don't, um, you can, you can maintain a faith, right? Especially, I, well, at least from my perspective, that the time in which I grew up, which wasn't too different from yours, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when you were a young Christian, the, the, there wasn't quite the same, um, how do you say, like society hadn't fully agreed that evolution was true. Mm -hmm. right? it, was, it was still kind of question in the air, at least in the circles I was in, mm -hmm. even in the university, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you grow up reading like creationism books and things that people have around in church circles. And then it sort of like begins to creep in on you that, no, this is pretty pretty substantive, mm -hmm. right? And so then the world kind of, your own world divides a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and mine was held together principally by, you know, just my relationship with God <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. directly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And having that fairly strong charismatic background, that's mm -hmm. natural. Yet a lot of God number two. A lot of God number two, that's right. Yep. Um, but anyway, so then when, when Peterson starts talking like he does, I'm like, oh, it's completely new. This kind of like finding finding a rational path, if you will, back to God. Yep. Um, but I was also interested in because I had had this moment where I realized, oh, maybe the world's not divided in that way, but from a completely different point of view. Mm -hmm. And maybe I guess I could start talking about that. Sure. If you like. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. Go ahead. As I go. Yeah. Go. Keep going. You're doing great. All right. Um, 
So I had read, uh, during seminary, I had read, not for seminary, but I had read uh, Chesterton's Orthodoxy. Mm. I think a professor mentioned it. And mm. it's not like I had all kinds of extra time when I was like trying to run a company and go through uh, seminary. <laughs> but I read it. Yep. And I was, I was uh, first of all, the first time I read it, I did not understand it. I mean, I understood it in some ways, but I right. didn't understand right. And actually, to this day, I don't fully understand all the implications of what he's saying. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I read it again, and I think I'm up to about five times through it. It's not that big a book anyway. But um, I found it utterly captivating because he, he talks about um, basically that transcendence is foundational and that we make sense of the world by making transcendence foundational. Hmm. Hmm. And if you try to make the rational foundational and flatten everything, like, like you were talking about, I think you were talking about, you said, uh, you did a word study on explanatory. Yeah. 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 It flattens yeah, you everything. Flatten it. Yeah. That's right. That it makes everything mystical <laughs> that you mm -hmm. can't understand a thing at the end of the day. And he's, he's, you know, Chesterton's a little bit, um, uh, there's lots of rhetoric. <laughs> a little snarky. He so loves he's, the uh, snark. <laughs> oh yeah. So he's looking at the whole like skeptical history yep. there, right? Yep. But but it's it rings true. It rang true to me, but I didn't really understand the implications. So this is like sort of churning in the back of my head. Yep. And then late one night, for some reason, it's kind of just turning over in the back of my head, and I just I realize all of a sudden that calculus, which is the math, yeah. that's central to engineering. Yeah. And in fact, it's central to almost all modern technology. Like it enables almost, it enables everything that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and most sciences, at least all the physical sciences, mm -hmm. um, that calculus actually has the same form that Chesterton is describing. Really? Yeah. So, Unlike, like, I know it's all called a math mm -hmm. in the same way that like geometry or algebra or these things are called a math, but it's actually completely different, except that it uses numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and you use it to calculate things. But, you know, geometry starts from, uh, from ra a rational basis, right? Like right. you start with a circle, a line, and then you, right. you make conclusions out of that. And they're all deductive. Yeah, we had that. Did you see the conversation I did with Eric on on Euclid? Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so you know it was a Euclidean world. Yeah. Uh, during like uh, the Renaissance. Yeah. Right. It was a Euclidean worldview. Yeah. Uh, largely, I, I think people could pick away at say that Aquinas wasn't fully that for sure. Right. Yeah. But, um, that's the way they did math. And it was, and, and math and philosophy and theology, they were all connected, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, along comes a bunch of Italian mathematicians in the 15th century. If I got that wrong, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. in the 15th century, and they start doing uh, calculations using something called infinitesimals. And infinitesimal, the word itself is a paradox because it's yes. infinitely small, yes. but it's something. Yes. And um, first of all, the Jesuits wanted to have nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and they suppressed it huh. in Italy, huh. largely. Now, and this is all, there's a larger history of this. And there's a, basically what I, when, when this idea occurred to me, I went looking for, right. has someone written about this? Where is this? Right. Where is this refuted? <laughs> right. Right. Or why am I, am I wrong or am I right? And I'm just using a different words to describe it. So I looked and looked, can't really find much. A friend of mine said that this is what Kant was talking about, but I had a shot at Kant and I'm, mm, mm, I don't know. Yeah. Not quite there. I understand some of the edges of it. Anyway, I, fe I came upon this book called Infinitesimals, which was written like, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. 
and it's a history of uh, this math. And that's where I get this bit about the Jesuits suppressing it, et cetera, et cetera. And Galileo's mixed up in this. How do you, how do you spell it? I'm trying to look it up on Amazon. Oh, let me. So it's like infinite. In, okay. And then S-I-M-A-L. And the author is uh, Amir Alexander. So it's pretty well written, fairly accessible if you don't know much about math even. Uh, and uh, so anyway, so these people are like a generation before, um, like Newton, who formalized calculus, and, and Leibniz. Uh, who did it in parallel, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're basically the fathers of what we use as modern calculus today. But these people a generation before were in the middle of this fight. Huh. In Italy and in England. So the book is fascinating because he, he tells you all this. He knits together the politics of the day, the philosophy of the day, the battles... Uh, you know, because the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So this yeah. is why the Jesuits were trying to control things. Yeah. So it's a fascinating, fascinating history. And so, you know, I went looking to see where this idea I had cropped up. And I went, oh, this isn't just a fun, beautiful idea in my head. This is actually, like, fundamental to Western history and history of technology. Um, so... The other part of that book, and if I'm going on too long about this. No, 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 keep going. I'm hooked, baby. I'm hooked. All right. Awesome. <laughs> uh, well, I'm hooked. It's been like two years of me rolling around with this uh, and reading and looking and whatever. But um, the second half of this book he talks about Hobbes and an English mathematician, John Wallace, who had like a decades long battle. So John Wallace was one of the first uh, like founding members of the Royal Society of Science in England. And he was using this infinitesimal's math. And Hobbes, because Hobbes had kind of a, uh, well, you know, like Leviathan, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you yeah. know, a full control, a Euclidean view, if you will. Yeah. Hobbes almost broke his, well, I don't know if I, almost broke his head trying to square the circle, which is this mathematical thing that right. people can do, right? By you right. putting it on the tree, you can't, you can't make a circle. Uh, anyway, you can look it up. If, um, so, and they had this long back and forth battle because it was so important to Hobbes and his philosophy and trying to maintain the world. And anyway, the author, Amir Alexander, does a brilliant job of contextualizing all this in the midst of the Protestant Reformation, the problems in England, the overflow of uh, overthrow of the king that happened somewhere in that period. That How many books can I read on this flight to Australia? I mean, you're, you're um, keep going. You, man, um, this is this is amazing. So. Um, so anyway, that's enough, right, of, of that history, like, as far as, yeah. I think, to make the point yeah. that, that the birth of this math was, it, it was like a cataclysm in how science math was done. And I think it's hugely underreported in, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, because partly it drove people nuts that they, you can't prove that it works. Like you can't you can't prove it back to first principles, right? Like you can of, Euclid, of course, yeah, Euclid or algebra or any other, right? Right. You you can't go back. And, and in modern math, like they, there's mathematicians listening to this. Eventually, they'll say, "Oh no, that there's this other like sort of roundabout proof in the 20th century or something." I don't know, yeah. but certainly at the time, um, it was justified because it worked. And what it enabled people to do was actually model the actual world. Right, right. Which is different, right? It's right. philosophically different right. from imposing geometry right. on the world, to speak roughly. 
Right. 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 So I, and I haven't done enough reading to chase this down, but it's my suspicion that part of the strength of, oh, I've slipped the word. Uh, <laughs> when you measure something and therefore it's true, that's the philosophical term is like, or it's every scientist talks about it. Like it's reason and oh, empiricism. Empiricism. Yeah. Part of the, like, People before this period, of course, people looked at what worked and what didn't and changed what they were doing accordingly. Sure, sure, right? sure. right. But empiricism had no philosophical teeth. Right. I think that this acceptance of calculus, of this calculation by infinitesimals, gave empiricism philosophical teeth in the context of the 17th century when it really came to the fore. Wow. Because it, it it says that you can't you can't prove that it worked you right. can't prove from first principles that it is right. but it works therefore it's therefore depending we, on who's saying it therefore it's true therefore it's good enough for good enough for us yeah, whatever yeah yeah that's fascinating so um, so then if I start saying to myself, uh, if that's how the physical world is, if that's how we apprehend the physical world, at least, yeah. but that's how we model, that's the form of the physical world. Um, and that also works uh, as far, according to Chesterton, in the psychological world and the, in the way we communicate, the way we are, it's a universal principle. It's the nature of the world that transcendence actually underpins everything. And I thought, okay, well, I, I maybe I just leapt over, I didn't have the word divided world at the time, right, but right. I had the sensibility about it. Right, 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 maybe, right. Maybe I've just stepped over the divide here huh. or taken or, or, or changed the viewpoint to a point where the world isn't divided when mm -hmm. viewed in this mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. Hmm. So how has this affected you? Because we, we have an engineer and a pastor talking about math and theology and philosophy. I mean, there's, you know, <laughs> mathematicians and theologians and philosophers are going to be chafing. <laughs> <laughs> sure those, those practitioners they always run fast and loose with the theory <laughs> that might work in reality but it doesn't work in theory, in theory that's right i know right <laughs> isn't that what the french engineers say that's i always right. say that's the quote right? That's right uh but isn't that the fact i mean well anyway <laughs> um well i mean engineering is applied science yeah yeah yeah. So uh, that's, in fact, the name of my degree was applied science. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I have no trouble saying that uh, I like it applied <laughs> to the real world. <laughs> huh. so, so then as I've gone on, um, so taking that as like my starting point now, yeah. Yeah. I thought, okay, so maybe this is actually a more fundamental idea. Mm -hmm. Not just a happy coincidence mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. seems like um, it seems like the incarnation is not an interruption in the world. Right, right, right. Right, but is foundational. Certainly foundational to Christianity. Right, right, right. The the, the you know for for me this whole Peterson journey which is, and I always, you know, I phrase it that way because it's not just Peterson, it's all of you. It's the people, it's the conversations we're having right now. You know, this just, just really helped me at a deeper level, you know, flip the world in terms of, you know, just like you, just like you expressed mm -hmm. and, and see it and, and, and more easily. We, we, we don't, we don't appreciate the degree to which we are formed by that which we are not paying attention to. And so the, you know, a number of years ago, I just felt 
boy, there's, there's just, there's just way too much. There's just way too much materialism in my soul. What, what do I need to do with that? Because if I, if, you know, if that, if that starts taking over the consciousness Congress, um, you know, things, things could get, things could get ugly. And, and so then, you know, I, I had read Lewis all my life, but I had never read miracles and I read, I read his, his book miracles. And that just kind of, that just kind of a whole bunch of stuff that had just kind of gone past the checkpoint. Lewis yeah. then was the cop and said, now, wait a minute, you know, let's, 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 let's examine these credentials. And, uh-huh. but, you know, and, and another piece that for me has been inter- interesting is that, you know, right in that late medieval period into the early modern period, a lot of stuff happened, much yeah. of which we know hardly anything about, just like what you just explained to me. I, I knew nothing about that, nothing. Nope. And, and, you know, we're both, we're both, okay, we're practitioners, we're not academics. Mm-hmm. We're reasonably educated, well-educated people. I mean, I was, before I got a degree in history, I was kind of thinking about getting a degree in math until I got into abstract algebra and realized, oh, that, you know, mm, uh, <laughs> that was it for me and my math major, abstract algebra. I got a B in the class, but I was looking around at other people getting A's. I thought, they're mathematicians. I'm not. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, but there, you know, and the Protestant Reformation is is in this in a lot of interesting ways. And of course, I was educated in it. And anyone in the kind of Christian education I received, you know, just kind of a shallow, politicized, weaponized, anti-Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, And and, but a lot of these deeper roots. So on on one hand, from the Protestant side, it's really important to recognize the Catholicity of the reformers which yeah, is yeah. something which is really coming to the fore now in a lot of Protestants. On the Catholic side, there's something to be said. Uh, the Reformation happened for a reason. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you really have to work on figuring out what that reason is. because it, and, it's, and it's way more than just um, corruption of the priesthood and, and some of those. Those, were, those are expressions of... So anyway... So I, I, you're, boy, no, you're I, really interesting. No, I'm with you there. And I have done so much, because uh, it really challenged me going through seminary about, because I'm a Protestant. I, I know I was Catholic, uh, baptized and confirmed. But as an adult, I've, I've gone to Mass a few times, because um, I actually really like it. Um, but uh, generally, I've been in, in Protestant churches. My wife and I have ended up now, uh, at a Anglican church in Toronto. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. The Anglicans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it's so funny because so many, so many Protestants that are kind of at this front edge become wistful Anglicans now, but <laughs> but they're they're still divided by the main culture war divide that we see happening, mm-hmm. and. Yeah. And I mean, because if there's any place that this culture war divide is fierce, it's it's amongst the Episcopalians and the Anglicans, because oh, yeah. oh man, you know it's. I go to it's a it's a smaller Anglican church in Toronto. Yeah, beautiful place, great preaching. I love the liturgy. It's a tone, you know, it's a simplified liturgy compared yeah. to the, the Catholic Church. Um, but this church has so many. Uh, Ex evangelicals, yeah, yeah, of which I would count myself that, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, um, and and the culture divide just within the congregation is substantial, yeah, in terms of politics, le- degree of belief, all all those things, right? Yeah. Like it's there's no getting because when you're new to a church, which we still are, kind of, it's a couple of years, yeah, you you try to you try to get a read on. Why? Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? What can I? What can I say? That's All right, those right. things. What, what will I lose status by admitting in this place? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, you know that—that's all complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you asked me what it's done for me. Um, well, first of all, I was transfixed with joy when the idea first occurred to me. Wow. 
oh yeah, I was sitting up and, and my wife came in because uh, she was, she was uh, um, well, actually to tell you the truth, I, I snore. So I was sleeping in, I was supposed to be sleeping in another room. I wasn't sleeping. <laughs> my wife came in and I'm like, uh, just so happy. And she said, how are you doing? I said, I'm wonderful. I said, can you guess what, can you guess what I'm thinking about? And she says, oh, what? Because, well, you know. Um, me? Are you thinking about me? <laughs> no, honey. <laughs> no, no, Philosophers. <laughs> no, I said, I'm thinking about calculus. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus. <laughs> and so she loves telling that story. Because... Uh, <laughs> But that was the truth of it, because I was like, ah, so I met, so in a sense, I'm, I'm meeting, meeting Christ in the midst of my work, yeah. in the midst of, uh, in the midst of the math that underpins my work at least. Yeah. And, and, and it just, it did reconnect the landscape of my world. Yeah. So that, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I guess, um, in some ways I think about, um, uh, oh, St. Patrick's, was it St. Patrick's Shield? You know, Saint, have you ever read St. Patrick's Prayer? No. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's called St. Patrick's Shield. It's like, you know, it's basically a, a poem, uh, you know, five stanzas long, but the second to last stanza, he goes on as Christ before me, Christ behind me. St. Patrick's Christ... breastplate. Breastplate, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, he goes he he goes on with like Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ to the right of me, right, Christ to the left of me. Mm -hmm. Christ above Christ, me. Christ in Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above right. me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, when I lie down, when I sit down, when I arise. In the heart of every man who thinks um, who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. I rise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession in the oneness of the creator of creation. Wow. Yeah. No, it, it's so beautiful. So I guess in some senses, that's what it did for me mm. is rather than my Christianity being like this kind of like tunnel mm -hmm. relationship in my worldview, mm -hmm. it reestablished it as my world. So God number one and God number two came together. Yeah, early. that's right. Yeah, the I think division, so. The division was, the division was eliminated. I think that's right. I think that's right. So, um, should I, should I go on? Yes, by all okay. means. All right. So I was really, uh, I, I listened to your conversation with, is it Cord? Yes. Cord? Cord yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. And I actually put something in the comment section to him. Um, but, and he responded. It was really nice. Um, but he was talking about, uh, the, the mapping the world as oh. like with, yeah. And in the comment section, because it's exactly what I've been thinking about um, as a way to kind of picture um, how we look at the world. Um, I've been thinking about the, the actual, the, the asymptote. So you remember your math? No. So an asymptote is where, uh, you know, you're going along a number line and then you hit infinity. Mm -hmm. And the curve goes up. Yep, 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 yep. Never reaches, but yep, yep, yep. Right? Yep. So yep. it's approaching this limit. Yep. Right? So that's an asymptote. Yep, yep, okay. So whenever I hear, in fact, whenever I hear Peterson talking about going up a hill or any talk of uh, enlightenment, I think it's nice this, that we have a picture of a mountain, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's a top. Mm -hmm. or put differently god's at the top and so you can never reach there mm -hmm. 
it's the it's that someone pulled out oh, it was rick my my friend who who gave me this pulled out the dollar bill the other sense that you know showed the triangle but the eye the eyes above the triangle it's oh. the, it's the asymptote you can't you don't actually get to this all-seeing eye on top of the triangle mm -hmm. oh oh that's good and so the implications if you start using that as a lens through which you see these things and that's what i've been trying to do yeah and all of a sudden i have more uh uh um i understand calvinism a little bit better <laughs> yeah 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 and actually i think it has looking at it that way i think it has the, the maybe the possibility of unifying the two views mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. of course i can agree with uh, and i i don't know calvinist theology very well um and i, I guess you could tell i'm not one <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of Anglicans were Calvinists. No, it's true. It's, it's a funny mix, right? Yep, yep, yep. But actually, as a sidebar, I, what I find delightful about the Anglican Church is it's not formed and identified based on theology. Yeah. yeah right? It's, it's yeah. identified based on practice. Yeah. Which I, if someone had told me that as a positive 15 years ago, I'd be like, hmm. Or, or we might, Or we might argue Anglicanism is identified based on a language, which is English. Oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's a state church, and That's and what's state. what was what's interesting about state churches are that they see this is where the the Christian Reformed Church as refor as opposed to the RCA because there's the split right. in the Netherlands Church. Mm -hmm. So the Christian Reformed Church is the descendant of the Free Church, not the yeah. state church. But yet, because of its Dutchness, it is it was at least for a while in the United States joined by a language. And, and I would imagine Anglicanism, it's a state church. And so you're going to have theological division within it. Yeah. Unlike yeah, a confessional no. church, which says, this is, we are defined by our theology. And, and yeah. the difficulty that you have is that the theological stream keeps moving and the, the confession tends to ossify. And that's, in a sense, what's happened with the Dutch Reformed churches. And that leads to a whole bunch of things that we don't have to get into. But, yeah. but your point is... Your point is really well made. I mean, Calvinism comes along. Each theological tradition, so here's uh, Richard Foster's lovely little book, Streams of Living Water, which, oh, oh you'd, you'd appreciate this book given how you grew up. <laughs> because basically what this book goes into is the different traditions, the different traditions make their contributions. Ah, yeah. And, so maybe I've read some excerpts out of that. In yeah, you could have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim, Tim Keller has this fascinating idea that when revival happens, now that, that's a word you have to use with a little bit, of, uh, little bit of discernment in America because it tends to be associated with tents and sawdust and camp meetings. Um, but Tim Keller's definition of revival are these moments in the church where it's like the church hits nitrous oxide and boom, uh, yeah. like early 20th century Korean revival. Um, there have been revivals in different places in, you know, throughout the history of the church, not just the Protestant churches, but throughout the history of the church. And one of the things that Tim Keller noted is that all of, in a sense, what happens when, what happens when, uh, what happens when revival hits is that all of the streams come together. The church, in other words, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Voltron. You know, you have these separate <laughs> lions, and yeah, most yeah, of the yeah. time the lions are just kind of out there doing their own thing, and the lions have their different emphases. But it's, yeah. it's when all the lions come together, that's when revival happens. The thing is, we can't make revival happen. Revival, again, is always a gift. And so I love, I love your, your imagery of the – I can't say the word, because math has been 30 years ago. You yeah, know, yeah. yeah the, sometimes. The yeah. asymptote. You, 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 don't, you don't actually, you can't actually climb that line to get to infinity. You just keep climbing. You won't actually get there. So theoretically, there's a gap, and that's between the, the pyramid and the eye on top on the back of the dollar. Right. And so it's, it always comes down. And that's what Calvinism emphasizes, is that yes. gap. Yep. That finally, we can't bridge the gap. That's, that's the heart of Calvinism, I think, really. 
No, and, and I, I can't disagree with that, obviously. Uh, some of the hard kind of rationalized doctrine, I, uh, I don't think, well, I can't. I, it's Calvin, I it's Calvinist hard. scholasticism, and a lot of Calvinists kind of like, <laughs> some yeah. really love it, others kind of cringe. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, but I think that that idea of kind of get up to the top is almost like, and not reaching it, it's like a human universal. So I began looking around for this, and then um, I've got a quote by a jazz musician. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. No, Sorry, no, no jazz musician quotes on my channel. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not up talking or apologizing, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, so uh, Sonny Rollins is a, a saxophone player. Uh, in the 60s. I, I don't know his stuff that well. So, uh, but he was being interviewed on our uh, national broadcaster uh, about, um, and the interviewer was asking him about, like, there was like, uh, he took a couple breaks during playing, at the height of his playing, to practice for a year hmm. and not make any money. So he's asking him this. And Sonny Rollins responds with, why? Why? Why is because I am such an incomplete player. I am really a guy that knows I should be playing more. So I know there is more and I need to get to that more place. So I love to practice and I am practicing to get to that place. And then he says, of the interviewer, can you, can you get there? Is it possible to get to the end or is that like pushing the boulder up the hill? Mm. And Rollins responds, right, it may be. It may be like that. But you know, each step further you take, you see more. It's like a vista. You might never get there. Every step you push the ball up, there is more exposed there for you to see. So it's a beautiful trip. And for me, I just thought that was just gorgeous. I, you know, that's really helping me in, so lately I've been thinking a lot about so you've got chaos and order. You've got the vision in the book of Revelation where there's no longer any sea. And of course, that bothers people who love the ocean. Because like, oh, <laughs> why would God take the ocean away? No, that's not the point. Listen to Jonathan Peugeot. It's symbolic. Um, yeah. But you get, you know, one of my favorite, one of my favorite ideas from C.S. Lewis is from The Last Battle, further up and further in. Yeah. And with what you've just talked about, because then you wonder, well, if there's all of it e if there's all of eternity, when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, yeah. there's no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So if we have all of eternity, won't we exhaust God? And the answer is no. No, no, and you no, think, no. Oh, 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 take that, take that materialism someplace else, please, because I have no patience for it, because this is just too good. No. <laughs> Absolutely. And will we, we even exhaust each other? Right. 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 So that's just the most beautiful thing that has come. Actually, how did it affect me? That's come out of this for me yeah. is it's kind of. Um, so we can have this conversation. Right. And the conversation is rational. Yes. Right. The basis for the conversation, the yes. way we converse. Right. Yes. yes. The way we, uh, you know, argue or agree or make points or we're, we're, that's the way we work as a society, right? Yep. It's impossible yep. without it. Yep. yep. So, you know, uh, when, um, when the new atheist or really anyone is demanding that we be rational, that everything be rational, like there's a reason for that, right? Yes. Yes. Because without it, political uh, union, like society doesn't function. Right. 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 But when they try to flatten people. Yep. 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 Right? yep. When they yep. try to flatten people. Yep. They don't recognize that there's a boundary there. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and that was actually, that is Kant. That's a little bit I understand from reading, not Kant, but people interpreting him. Okay. That's Kant saying, mm. no, you got to, you have to make um, this transcendental deduction mm. in order to have anything worthwhile in order. And that's, he uses that to develop his, uh, I forget the term for it, but his moral system. 
right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically the golden rule, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so the picture I have is that when we're talking, we're like two asymptotes that have like fabric between us. Mm -hmm. And I can um, understand more and more about you through rational means mm -hmm. and climb. So that's rationality, climbing up mm -hmm. the hill mm -hmm. of who you mm -hmm. are. Uh, I know I can use my wife as an example if you're more comfortable with that. But, you know, like... I'm not uncomfortable. I'm a very, <laughs> I'm a very not uncomfortable guy if you haven't picked yeah, yeah. it up yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but that's what we, we explore one another. And we never exhaust that. Right. And, and you're right. Lewis, I had forgotten that that's in the last battle. It's okay. also at the end of Paralandra. Oh, really? In the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. See, I yeah, can't yeah. read five books. I always try to read no, five no, books at once. No pressure from me. No pressure. No, uh, no pressure but, from you. It's pressure from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but all of a sudden, if you, I, I, I guess the picture I have of of this reality is like, uh, like the reality that we uh, get apprehend rationally mm -hmm. is like uh, a large, you know, multi-pole tent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and thousands of poles, right? And the right. fabric right. is stretched between them everywhere. Right. And that's us navigating this world that's supported by transcendence yep. Yep. at every pole. Yep. Well, the poles, the poles, you know, often with the tent, the pole ends at the, at the tent. In this case, the poles just keep going. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. And so... I actually think in some ways that's an explanation for postmodernism because I think when you, um, when you, when you demolish transcendence in your, in your worldview, then what is actually transcendent begins to appear as complexity simply. Uh. And so, and it's almost unnavigable complexity. Well, but this is, this is something I figured out a few months ago when, yeah. so, so Darwin, so, so when you listen to people like the celebrity atheist knocking around, you know, well, random, it's, it's not God, it's random. And then paused, I said, well, what is random? And you start digging into it. What random is, is complexity. It's, mm -hmm. it's complexity beyond what we can fathom or yeah. more importantly, colonize. And so oh, you yeah. just you've just taken that word and substituted it for God and said, but not God. And when I hear that, I hear, ah, uh, yeah, you're just, you, you just, you're just scared. And rightfully so you, you yeah. really don't want someone else that this is where the Calvinist comes out in me. You really don't want someone else choosing your destiny, do you? And so <laughs> you're just, it's willful denial is what it is, which is exactly what, what Paul says in Romans 1, what is our problem? We suppress yeah. the truth with our hearts. It's willful denial because that it's we are terrified by the idea that you know that someone else is choosing, and we are we are at the tail end of this story, and we we don't have a lick of control. Mm -hmm. we, we really and so now who's telling each other a convenient story, Mister Atheist? You're, you're, <laughs> You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be out here and say, no, I don't have a lick of control here. And I'm emotionally okay with that. And yeah, my religion is helping me with that. Absolutely. What's helping you? Lies? <laughs> so, so when you look at postmodernity, then you, you basically have, you basically have taken that idea of random and institutionalized it and made it pervasive yeah. In order to, and I think Peterson is right on this. So yeah, every, none of us are in control. So why don't you let me be in control? <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, that's really good. That's really helpful. No, that's real. That, it, because that, you know, that's what, that, that was driving me crazy out here. Well, well, it's random selection. Okay. Well, pause. Let's, let's talk about this word random a little bit because you don't see billiard balls being random if there's only eight of them on a table. That's because there's only eight. 
And when it comes to human behavior, there's just way too many forces to track, partly because the forces are historical and you don't have access to them because there's been no record of them. So you can't do the math. Yeah. And where does Aristotle's formal cause come into this? Well, and, you know, so when I started, so, so Strawn is this South African guy who he's blogging a little bit and tweeting a little bit now, but he, he talked, he jumped on me almost right away. And so he said, oh, you got to watch Verveke. And so then I was watching some of Verveke stuff and Verveke kind of nicely lays out Aristotle. And I never really understood Aristotle's formal cause until Verveke laid it out. And I thought, oh, okay. So, so if you, if you, you know, if you look at Peugeot, and and you say okay the patterns Peugeot and Peterson and their patterns you look at Peugeot and Peterson and their patterns at some point you have to say well well where do the patterns come from now a materialist might press hard and say well if in fact we knew enough we would and this therefore is their argument of faith uh, the, the, it would be it would be built into physics and so then it's like okay well where do the patterns in physics come from I mean, right. no, but, but we're, we're back, at least in my head, we're back to my initial revelation that that's right. That is built on transcendence. That's right. That's right. So, you know, uh, part of the new atheists or any atheist strength of argument is that look at what all science has done for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and part of, uh, I guess my point now is that, without calculus, without this dependence on the transcendent, without approaching the world like that, you don't have cell phones, you don't have cars, you don't have airplanes, you don't have rockets. You might not even have very good steam engines. You don't have modern buildings. You don't have much in modern technology without depending on the transcendent. So enough with the only rational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Enough with that. Yeah. Well, and, and this is, you know, this is part of the correlation with, with McGill Christ and Jonathan Haidt in terms of we're, I mean, the intuitive, the intuitive is the master and the rational is the emissary. The mm. elephant is actually doing the moving and the rider is telling just so stories to impress the other riders. Right, right, right. And well, then you say, well, where does the elephant come from? Or where does the intuitive come from? Well, that comes from random. Oh, okay. <laughs> so just, you don't know. And in fact, oh. you're saying you can't know. So. <laughs> yeah. I know. So. Uh, two more things about that okay. uh, that cross my mind okay. uh, is um, like science does do this work of climbing up the hill through rational public discussion because that's yes. part of that's part of and so they do get to like they do get to see more yep yep right yep, yep. They do, but I think if you use that image that they never reach the top, right? right. So they never, they never close the gap. Right. 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 So, you know, so the, 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 the gap, you use the God of the gaps phraseology is the asymptote mm. always. Mm. So they can, you know, so they can close sort of knowledge about you and me, about humans, about, you know, people made in the image of God down to consciousness or down to whatever's left, but that is transcendent and it never closes. So the case they make that, oh, we're closing all the gaps. Okay, that's great. It's really good work. <laughs> you're, you're closing gaps. You're not closing all of the gaps. No. And... Well, and I think uh, I love the way I love the way this is shaping up because you know one of the things that I also noted with the celebrity atheists was their eschatology. Don't worry, we'll solve, we'll we'll cure cancer. 
Good. When? After I'm dead of it, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 given given the rest of your worldview, you know, I'm screwed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're not you're not offering me anything. <laughs> oh, but no, all you have is your your rationalist pride. That's that's what the whole game is about. And I look at that and I say, what's that? I don't, I don't care no. about that. No. Oh, no, that's no. really good. So. The other thing, I think you interviewed someone uh, from Ontario, if I remember correctly, who had explored, was was exploring or was interested or had been practicing Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. Or at least Buddhism. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And he was making the point, I thought really beautifully, that Buddhism has this easier and easy on-ramp. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so in, in my mind... What that says is, yeah, it, it, it really works in our common culture today because it starts in the rational realm. And it tries, and, and Buddhism works to, not that, I, not that I know very much about Buddhism, but it appears to me like it starts in the rational realm and works towards transcendence. Yes, yes. The, especially the, 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 the Buddhism that has gotten popular in the secular West with secular atheist people. Yeah. With my secular atheist friends usually. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, because they say, oh, I don't need I don't need a metaphysic. I this is this is simply pragmatic for helping me deal with the the complexities and and pains of life. Yeah, absolutely. So when looked at that way, it's like it's it's an inversion of Christianity. Mm-hmm. So Christianity says you, you start by uh, integrating the transcendent. Yes. Hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. It's like. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You know, Hero Israel, the Lord your God. You know, if you're an ancient, if you're an ancient Israelite, it's like, okay, so we're going to, it's, it's going to be this, this one that we follow instead of these. The Lord your God is one. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And even um even uh hmm, even Christian practice, right? We're yeah. supposed to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So for me there's a real mirror there yeah. to what I'm talking about. That yeah. that the Holy Spirit uh helps us navigate the world. Yeah. But it's foundational. You don't you're not approaching the Holy Spirit. Right, right. Right? Right. It's, it, it's, it's the starting seed, yes, right? Yes. And so it's, 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 a, it's an inversion. And it's like Chesterton was saying, <laughs> that you start with mysticism, with this mystical, with the transcendent, yeah. with a little, a little leap of faith. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. It was funny. I was explaining this this calculus idea to people at work who are not uh, well. Some are Christian, some are not. Right. Um, and and the person uh, who one of the people I was explaining it to has absolutely zero church background. I don't, uh, you know, like no knowledge at all. And and she said, "Oh, it's is that like it's like a leap of faith?" And so I said. Yes, calculus is like an automation of leaps of faith. <laughs> it's the systemization of this. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. So that's wow. what I've been that's what I've been working on and thinking about. And I was so delighted to hear everything you've been talking about and uh, and, and Peterson because I've been kind of like I don't know in my spare time trying to write or whatever, right? Yeah. This is really cool. This is really, really good. So, so you, you, you're you going to let me post this, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm very happy to. I, 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 I look forward to the, uh, the criticism. <laughs> good, good. Because you know? I hate it when I have a conversation like this and the person's like, I can't really post this. I'm like, I, I, that, that, that. you're robbing the world. You're robbing the world. <laughs> well, 
Yeah, I mean, I, at some point, I've got to start engaging the world with the idea. So I started a little blog post okay. to write about stuff, but I haven't written about this yet, but okay. I needed to get, because it's, it's complicated to write about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, and, and again, and this is where Peterson has been so helpful because, you know, so, so what has Peterson done? And to me, what he's done is he kind of created a platform and a flag. Jordan Peterson became this flag. And all yeah, these yeah. people have kind of gathered around him because this crazy Canadian from University of Toronto talked on all these different things in such an interesting way. And we all kind of gather here to like, oh, what's, what's going on with this guy? And, and all with different aspects. And so, and, you know, I had a conversation with a, with a friend of mine the other day and he's like, well, you should, it's too bad you don't have like hours to do like Joe Rogan. I said, yeah, but the thing is, you all are coming to me. And what's been so cool about this is I could never find you in any of this. No, not a chance. Find me. Well, uh, I have to say, I meant to say earlier, uh, like off the top, that what you what you've been doing, I thought was so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Because I really I watched the conversations you've had with people from all kinds of different points of view, and uh, I saw you like like you've drawn me out. Uh, I've seen you just drawing people out and it's really a beautiful work and I don't know if I've ever seen anything quite like it and uh, you know and your your uh, your combination of uh, you know commitment to seeing the truth in things and drilling down but also the humility to do that in conversation and publicly is quite beautiful oh, it's you know? been fun I, I, oh yeah 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 I'm just having I fun had baby. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, this has been great. So I, I, you know, it's so bad because I'm so impulsive. So it's like, I got to post this one today, you know, so I probably will. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> if you want, that's great. Um, I don't think I've mentioned anything too personal. No, no, no. It's just so. that you, you're, you're hat. No, I'll, I'll leave it alone. It, it's, it, this was, this was a delight and, and the folks are going to you know, and, and again, the math connection with my, with my channel has been so amazing. All these mathematicians and people interested in math. And I thought, I never would have pieced this together with math. But no, because that's the thing that occurred to me. It's like, why did we stop connecting math, philosophy, and theology? Yeah, yeah. We're the only, the modern culture is the only culture that's done that. Yeah. Right? You look at yeah. the Greeks, yeah. you look at the the right through uh, everything up till the end of the Renaissance, all part of a larger dialogue together. Yeah. For some yeah. reason, we like just use just use math. Yeah. Yeah. Stop yeah. Being. Yeah. Oh, we're such we're such we're such rapists. You know, we just <laughs> use math. You know, it's like oh, we're, we're terrible people. See, I'm a Calvinist. We're terrible people. We really are. <laughs> all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Without exception. <laughs> so before we go, can I, can I mention my, my blog site? Because yes, I have please do. just a couple short pieces on there that... Um, email, it, email it to me too so I can put it in the link. Sure. It's just, it's humanetranscendence.com. Humanetranscendence.com. Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know about the name, but it, I thought it was good to that kind sounds of cool bridge, to me. bridge worlds a little bit. So yeah. let's, let's get you some traffic on your blog. It's, this, is, this is awesome. It's not monetized, but I like feedback. And if you have some ideas for the, for how I should entitle this, um, you know, throw throw those in the email too. So I've got a conversation right after this. Some poor guy getting up in the middle of the night from Australia to talk to me, and then um, and then my next few days are just nuts. So I'm going to be off the grid for a while. But um, but send me the email. And hopefully, I'll get sure. this posted right away. And uh, no, I can't. Sure. Well, I can't wait you. to see what happens with it. Thank have you so much, Chris. Thank you. Have a great trip. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.